Hi, my name is Andrew Hallam. I'm the author of Millionaire Teacher and Millionaire Expat. I was a personal finance teacher. I am a finance columnist and I've been investing in the stock market since I was 19. I turn 50 next week, so that's 31 years of investing in the stock market. I decided to share what I've learned here in this stock market investing for beginners. This is part four, what is an index fund? Many people have heard of these products, or you may have heard of these products and may wonder, well, what exactly are they? They stem from something called an indices. So the Dow Jones Industrials and the S&P 500 are the two most famous indices in the world. The Dow Jones Industrials represent 30 really large US stocks, essentially created by a committee. And those 30 stocks don't change much year to year. When you look at or when you are watching television or you're reading the Wall Street Journal and they talk about the Dow rose 5% this year or it rose 2% today, whatever that might be, what they're really doing is they're looking at how did the 30 big Dow stocks perform? And if you'd invested an equal amount into every single one, how much would you have gained or lost during that given day period of time? So the Dow Jones industrial stocks include the big stocks like Microsoft, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil. The S&P 500 is another indices. It was created in 1926. Instead of just including 30 big American companies, it includes 500 large American companies. You could think of them as the largest companies in the United States, but they too are selected based on the diversity of their economic sectors, but they're all really big businesses. The S&P 500 is probably a more accurate representation of how the stock market performs because it tends to be broader, representing a greater number of stocks. But long term, they perform about the same. If you look at any 10 year period, you'll see that the Dow Jones Industrials and the S&P 500 perform similarly. Here's the last 10 years. You can see how $10,000 would have grown in each case in blue. The Dow Jones Industrials, if you divvied that $10,000 into all 30 of those stocks, you would end up with $26,794 by March 31st, 2020. If you'd invested $10,000 and split it among the 500 big stocks in the S&P 500, then that money would have grown to 28429 This doesn't mean that the S&P 500 stocks outperform the Dow Jones Industrials. You can see the opposite occurring over the following 10 years. It's important to note too that every single stock that is in the Dow Jones Industrials is also a component of the S&P 500. Well, what is an index fund? If you had invested in an index fund, and let's use the S&P 500 index as an example, you would own a sliver of all 500 shares within the S&P 500 and nobody would actively trade those shares. So there's no active fund manager at the helm. There's no professional trader at the helm. So nobody is saying, well, we're going to buy a little bit more McDonald's and we're going to sell Facebook this week and Starbucks is doing really well. So we're going to add Starbucks to the fund. We didn't have it last week. Oh, you know what? We're really thinking, Amazon's going to be great. Let's double up on the amount of money that we have in Amazon. That's what an active trader would do, but an index is different. If you owned an S&P 500 index, your money is virtually divvied up, divvied up into virtually every single share in the S&P 500, all 500 of those stocks and no trading occurs whatsoever. You own them all, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. There were two big proponents for creating an index fund, essentially an unmanaged fund. On the right, we see a young uh, picture of a really young John Bogle, who was the founder of Vanguard. When he wrote his master's thesis, he hypothesized that if somebody had created an index fund, and this is before index funds were created, but if somebody created an index that's just which just tracked 500 large stocks in the United States, he hypothesized that it would outperform the vast majority of active traders after fees. 
Bertton Malkiel is an uh, economist from Princeton University, a professor who also said he believed much the same thing, that a portfolio that tracked or a fund that tracked the S&P 500 index or any kind of stock market index that didn't have any trading associated with it would outperform most active fund managers. Well, in 1976, well, Burton Malkiel actually wrote the book, The Random Walk Down Wall Street in 1975. And that's where he stated that for the first time. That was before an index fund was actually created. The following year, John Bogle had created one for Vanguard. And at first, it was a laughing stock. People thought, how could you possibly make money with this thing? And if you did make money with it, how could you actually end up even coming close to the returns of professional active fund managers. 10 years later, they weren't laughing as hard. We can see here that the fund's inception from 1976 until just 10 years later would have seen growth of 274% for Vanguard's S&P 500 index fund, a completely unmanaged fund. 10 years later, well, the 20 year return from 1976 to 1996 was 933%. The 30-year total return was 2,840%. The 40-year total return was a whopping 5,850%. The 44-year track record up to March 31st, 2020 was a gargantuan 8,000 619% gain since 1976. Well, how many actively managed funds beat the S&P 500 index? We can look to the SPIVA scorecard for the answer. SPIVA stands for Standard & Poor's Indices versus Active Management. Very few of them end up matching the performance of an index, despite all of their tactical trading. If we look at the 15 year period from January 2005 to January 2020, we can see that 9.54% of actively managed large cap stocks ended up beating Vanguard's S&P 500 index. Well, this brings the question, well, why not just buy the actively managed funds that won? If about 10% of them will beat the index during a lengthy time period, don't we look then at which funds beat the index and then just purchase the winners? It seems to make sense intuitively. However, funds that win during one time period often underperform or even crash and burn during the following measured time period. Performance typically isn't sustainable. This is called reversion to the mean. The SPIVA Persistence Scorecard every six months or so publishes data where they'll look at top performing funds during a given time period. And then they look at what percentage of those top performing funds continued to be top performing funds. So September 2015, they identified 567 US actively managed funds, which were among the top 25% of performers over the previous three years. These are the funds most people would be attracted to if they were looking at buying actively managed products. Now we go four years forward to September 2019. What percentage of those 567 funds maintained their top 25% ranking? If you believed in performance persistence, you would say 100% of them, all of them. If they were in the top 25% in terms of their performance during one three year period, then they're going to be in the top 25% after that period. Well, in this case, less than 1% of them maintain their winning ways. This is why it makes very little sense to buy actively managed funds. Funds that perform well during one time period often, more often than not, underperform during the next time period. Wise investors instead purchase index funds or ETFs. They build diversified portfolios of indexes or ETFs, which I'm going to talk about later in subsequent videos, how to purchase them, what specifically to buy. You might be wondering, and it really makes sense, why is it that index funds beat most actively managed funds? You might be asking yourself or saying, well, hang on a second, if this reversion to the mean exists, then index funds 
as a result of performing well will likely underperform during another measured time period going forward. If that's how you're thinking, awesome. I want you to think that and I want you to think critically. In part five, I'm going to answer that question. Why do index funds beat act most actively managed funds and why will they continue to do so? I'm Andrew Hallam. I hope you found this useful. If you did, please subscribe to my channel, click like, uh, post a comment. I'd love to see some comments. And thanks very much. Stay safe and take care. Bye-bye.